Welcome back. This is the second week of administrative law. I hope you're finding these lectures helpful. One of the advantages they offer you is that you can watch them at your own pace, pausing as needed. If you miss something I've said, you can rewind and rewatch as many times as it takes. And you don't have to worry about my calling on you, at least not until we're back in the classroom. And no, I am not Q ad law. Q ad law is said to be the accomplice of Q anon, whom you may have heard of. And if I were Q ad law, I'd deny it anyway. Last time we began our discussion of the non delegation doctrine. This is a doctrine that sets a limit to Congress's power under Article I of the Constitution. In the document itself, the non-delegation doctrine has two hooks. One is a textual hook, and the other a structural hook. The textual hook is the vesting clause of Article I, which vests the legislative power in a Congress. This hook cannot take the entire weight of the doctrine, however. By its terms, it is a vesting clause and not a no-divesting clause. The structural hook is the more important. The Constitution envisages a federal government consisting of three independent branches. The three branches are intended to serve as checks and balances upon each other. Each of the three branches will usually tend to expand its power, but each branch is expected to stand up to the others to balance and check their expansive tendencies. Congress's power to legislate cannot include the power to put itself out of business. In particular, even if Congress happens to judge that it is necessary and proper to assign or delegate some of its legislative power to another branch, the Constitution disables it from doing so. Much less does Congress have power to give any of its power to make laws to a private entity, as in the Carter-Cole case. That would be legislative delegation in its most obnoxious form, according to the unanimous court. But apart from the three Depression-era cases, Schechter Poultry, Panama Refining, and Carter Cole, the court has not found non-delegation problems with congressional legislation that seems to delegate sweeping power to the president and to the federal agencies. In one case, the Brig Aurora, the court held that an act that would be legislation if Congress did it itself was not legislative because it merely directed the president to make a certain action to take a certain action upon his finding a certain fact. In another case, the statute was upheld because the discretion it gave the pres the executive branch was merely to fill in the gaps Congress had left on purpose to be filled. But fact-finding and gap-filling were subsumed in the Hampton case under the intelligible principle rubric. A congressional statute is not unconstitutional if it contains an intelligible principle to guide the official who receives authority under the statute. An intelligible principle might consist in very general, even vague notions, such as the public interest, convenience, or necessity under the Federal Communications Act or fair competition under the Federal Trade Commission Act. For the first three decades of the post-World War II era, the non-delegation doctrine was seen as toothless. But lawyers can never simply assume the non-delegation doctrine cannot bite. In the so-called benzene case, five members of the court wrote expressing concern that Congress may have delegated legislative power to the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA. The issue in the case was a rule OSHA had promulgated to set maximum safe exposure levels of benzene, a known carcinogen. The evidence indicated that exposure even to a single molecule of benzene could cause cancer. OSHA chose to set a threshold higher than zero, one part per million, acting upon the statutory directive to set a standard that most adequately assures, to the extent feasible, 
that no employee will suffer material impairment of health. Four members of the plurality wrote that this language meant that OSHA had to make an explicit threshold finding that anything higher than one part per million would constitute a significant risk of harm. OSHA had not dotted this I. But what is of interest to us is why the plurality thought the statute had to be read that way. If OSHA did not have to quantify the risk sufficiently to, quote, to characterize it as significant, the statute would make such a sweeping delegation of legislative power that it might be unconstitutional under Schechter Poultry, end of quote. Might be, mind you. The plurality opinion showed that the non-delegation doctrine could exert a gravitational pull on the court in its interpretation of statutes. This was new. And a fifth justice, Justice Rehnquist, concurring separately, thought the statute did violate the non-delegation doctrine because it contained this clause. To the extent feasible. This innocuous sounding clause was fatal in his view. Without that to the extent feasible clause, OSHA would have had, in Justice Rehnquist's view, to set a zero standard, which would have spelled ruin for industries that expose their workers even to trace amounts of benzene. But the feasible clause allowed OSHA to set a non-zero standard that would not be ruinously costly to meet. He wrote, quote, The language, to the extent feasible, does nothing other than render what had been a clear, if somewhat unrealistic, standard largely, if not entirely, precatory." End of quote. But here is where he saw a much deeper problem. Congress did not merely delegate discretion to choose where on a continuum to draw a line, as if Goldilocks had been chosen to decide what was the right temperature for porridge. This is because the underlying issue was whether or not to set a dollar value on a human life, and if so, what dollar amount? The OSH Act, in his view, assigned this profoundly controversial decision to the agency. Congress was faced with one of the most difficult issues that could confront a decision maker. Whether the statistical possibility of future deaths should ever be disregarded in light of the economic costs of preventing those deaths. It is the hard choices and not the filling in of the blanks which must be made by the elected representatives of the people. What Justice Rehnquist's concurrence is most cited for, however, was his synthesis of a novel rationale for the non-delegation doctrine. The non-delegation doctrine, he wrote, exists to further three purposes to ensure that important choices of social policy are made by Congress, the branch most responsive to the popular will, to provide the delegate an intelligible principle to guide the exercise of discretion, and to enable reviewing courts to test that exercise against ascertainable standards. It is clear where the second of the three comes from, from Hampton and subsequent precedents that uphold statutes containing an intelligible principle. The third purpose has to do with the judicial branch. If a court engages in judicial review of an agency action under a statute, what is the court to do? The intelligible principle guides the court as well as the agency it reviews. This may sound like counting intelligible principle twice, but the first purpose is genuinely new important choices should be made by the branch most responsive to the people, to the extent feasible, we might add. The non-delegation doctrine presumes that the Congress is that branch, according to Justice Rehnquist. But that is not obvious. At the founding, senators were chosen not by direct election, but by state legislatures. 
The president, of course, is not directly elected, but is chosen by an electoral college. Is the executive or the legislative, legislative branch most responsive to their popular will? It certainly isn't the judiciary, staffed by appointees who have lifetime tenure, but under the non-delegation doctrine, it is the court that presumes to be the ultimate arbiter of what choices Congress may and may not assign to agencies and the president to make. Another case, Mistretta versus United States, is another minor landmark of the post schechter poultry career of the non-delegation doctrine. Prior to Congress's passage of the Sentencing Reform Act of 1984, criminal sentencing in the federal system allowed a wide degree of discretion to the sentencing judge. Criminal statutes typically assign a range of possible penalties, for example, one to five years or one to 20, and the district court judge, on the basis of a sentencing report and the prosecutor's recommendation, was to decide how long the convicted defendant would have to serve. Sentencing was individualized, which many agreed was a good thing, but the result was disparities in sentencing that seemed hard to justify. One robber might get one year, while another, for the same offense, might have to serve five. But disparity was only the surface problem. The underlying problem was the possibility of judicial corruption. Federal judges have been impeached for bribery involving payments in exchange for leniency. Congress was concerned enough about this to want to restrict the discretion of sentencing judges. The solution was a set of sentencing guidelines set out in a grid that for each federal crime enumerates certain aggravating and mitigating factors having to do with the offender and the offense. The sentencing judge would have to justify in writing any deviation from the precise, narrow sentence dictated by the guidelines. The guidelines are complicated. It would have been an, a major achievement had Congress drafted, debated, and adopted them. But Congress did not. Instead, Congress created a sentencing commission consisting of seven members, of which three had to be sitting federal judges. The sentencing commission promulgated the guidelines, and the guidelines were challenged on the ground that Congress had impermissibly delegated legislative power to the commission. In the Mistretta case, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of the Sentencing Act. The non-delegation doctrine challenge was set aside on the ground that the Act's enumeration of certain offense and offender factors sufficiently stated an intelligible principle guiding the Commission's exercise of guideline-making power. Justice Scalia dissented. In his view, it was neither here nor there that an intelligible principle could be found in the statute. The non-delegation doctrine, in his view, was not merely a matter of locating an intelligible principle. He wrote, the whole theory of lawful congressional delegation is not that Congress is sometimes too busy or too divided and can therefore assign its responsibility of making law to someone else, but rather that a certain degree of discretion and thus of lawmaking inheres in most executive or judicial action. Here, Justice Scalia says there is a whole theory behind the non-delegation doctrine, but it's not that Congress might delegate for the sake of convenience. The whole theory rests upon the realization that Congress has to recruit the executive and judicial branches and to keep them within bounds. The lawmaking function of the Sentencing Commission is completely divorced from any responsibility for execution of the law or adjudication. But isn't this the kind of separation of powers what, that Madison, Montesquieu, and Locke wanted? Justice Scalia thought not. This is an undemocratic precedent that we set because its recipient, that is the recipient of the power, is not one of the three branches of government. Reminiscent of Carter Cole, isn't it? In Carter Cole, the statute gave regulatory power to collectively bargains agreements between big private sector unions and producers, neither of which were branches of government. But no other member of the court saw the parallel. If the non-delegation was, doctrine was not toothless, it seemed incapable of determining the outcome in a post-Schechter-Poultry case. But now, 
American trucking comes rumbling along. Its first stop is the DC circuit. <laughs> 